moving on. Emblem Vault is also moving on, right? Or I should say migrating is a, a better word. Um, apparently, last week, Adam and I had teased it, and uh, I scared somebody with my exotic, <laughs> my, with my e e exotic analogies. So I will try to be uh, much more bland and straightforward uh, during this explanation than trying to you know, add some sort of personality to it. Emblem Vault. All right, here we go. And if anybody has any questions during this, please hop on stage. Um, we're more than welcome to, to answer everything. I tried to, we tried to lay it out as best as possible um, in our press release that we put out today. So Adam and I joined the team in November. And during this conversation, the initial conversations of, of joining the team, yeah. You know, we came to this this view and this vision that, you know, we wanted to help or shine light on historical NFTs. But like the bigger vision is to, you know, facilitate NFT trading across blockchains. And since then, it's grown to even more. Now it's take NFTs and tie them into protocols and marketplaces across every chain. Right. And it's, it's just grown and accelerated much faster uh, than we anticipated. Right. So it's a good problem to have. And we have this legacy collection that was minted. It was deployed September 9th, 2020. And this was deployed at a time before a lot of these standards were created. A lot of the, the new uh, infrastructure, the, the gas efficient stuff, and a lot of you know the uh, new features. And the collection has continued to balloon upwards to now 50,000 assets and 12,000 owners, which makes it the 48th largest contract on Ethereum and the sixth largest NFT collection in, in across the space. And so as this continues to grow, uh, it, it lacks some of the functionality that Emblem Vault is looking for uh, to further decentralize the product to uh, add uh, sufficient features for the different blockchains that need different types of functionality because it really uh, is different across every chain that you go to. And so we've been kind of building up to this moment. We've been putting out, you know, we have 40 plus different tutorials on our YouTube channel to help with showing you how to, you know, create a vault, unlock a vault, verification, and so forth. We've built a lot of these relationships now with all of the different marketplaces with the different protocols and it was there was a point where we were working with rare stamp to add an integration uh, about two weeks ago and uh, it kind of just was the point where we we're like all right we either we have to do this migration now or it's probably never going to happen because once you have this migration now we're adding even more to the supply and it's just become such a large endeavor that we basically had to tell them to pause um, the integration and that we were going to move forward with this. And man, what a coordinated effort this has <laughs> been over the last few weeks. I have to say, like the things that you guys don't see behind the scenes of getting in contact with OpenSea, getting in contact with Luxray, getting in contact with the protocols, finding out what legacies, uh, what legacy vaults are into what, what contracts and Right? How does the migration work? Uh, how do you present present this to the community? Like covering everything to it, it's been uh, quite a mission. We've been working on this very actively over the last few few weeks. And so, to put it short, um, I first I highly encourage everyone um, to look at the pinned post at the very beginning, even retweet it so that everyone can see it. Because if you own a legacy contract, then this affects you, and here, so for I'm gonna kind of run through this PR. So some of the issues with the Eblem Legacy contract: it's not um, not upgradable, it's not gas gas efficient, inability to interact with new features. For example, we've heard this many times every week since I've joined. We want a decentralized emblem vault, right? We want an open source <laughs> emblem vault. We want this. We want more decentralization. And so do we. We actually do too, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, we want a decentralized emblem vault too. Uh, in order to get there, we need to have an upgradable contract. We need to, to have more state-of-the-art technology to do those kind of things. Uh, it's a scattered collection. If you go to Emblem Vault and you go look at 50,000 NFTs from 12 different blockchains, <laughs> it is a 
mess. It's 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 a mess, and we're very aware of that. It's the, the best the, tagging system in the world does not fix that. <laughs> simply put, simply it, put. I mean, it, for it, just to to jump over it a little bit here, Jake. For you, <laughs> for anybody who's a collector, look, and we have tons of historical NFT collectors in this room right now. This is kind of how a lot of us entered this space. Um, and you all know the issue with the legacy collection. Um, everything is on one collection. So Rare Pepe's, Namecoin, uh, uh, Doge Party, everything is all one collection. Um, what the migration does at its core is allows all of those individual collections to live on their own, very own OpenSea page, right? To live independently by themselves. So communities can rally around those individual pages, right? So if you're talking to somebody and, you know, your dog father and you want to talk about Doge Party, it's real nice to be able to just point them to one link on OpenSea where they can see all the NFTs there. Um, that at the core is what this is about. Everything else is details. But for most people, most collectors, that's the main thing. That's the thing that's going to move needles for you know, certainly historic NFT collections, um, but also like with the rare stamps going forward, allows these new collections, new things, new things that pop up, bitmaps and ordinals and cursed ordinals and all of these things to live independently rather than in a big blob of the em emblem vault legacy contract. And and the main issue um, that we're solving here, and I'll, I'll call on you, uh, Dijantra, in a second. Scams, right? We've <laughs> seen this happen time and time again. And as I, as Adam and I have wor worked at Emblem since November, we see every time there's a new cat collection um, that finds its way into the legacy collection, these scammers come out and they use the same bag of trips tricks over yep. and over and over. Yep. And we've mitigated a lot of those, right? We've added that you have to have an asset inside of the vault. We've updated the flagging system many, many times. We've had to turn off ETH minting at some point. But there's only so much you could do on this contract because it is was deployed in 2020 and just, just does not hold the types of code for us to be able to upgrade that kind of stuff. And so if you've seen the three to four different curated collections we have between Ethscriptions, Curse Ordinals, and Urpape, you've not heard a single issue when it comes to the issues that exist on em Emblem Legacy. And so with Ethscriptions that popped up, we were just like, all right, this, this, we have the case studies. It's proven. We're going to cut out and eliminate, you know, 99.9% .9 of the issues that exist on, on Emblem Legacy. And so now we're going to make uh, this coordinated effort. And uh, so I'm going to call on uh, Decentralize for a second, and then I'll go continue with the rest. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, we can come back to this after you finish. But I, you, I was going to ask this before you started this speech in, in general. Like, so... Are you guys sort of heading towards a not an on cyber type experience, but like a multi chain, almost MySpace for NFTs type thing? Or are you kind of focusing on being like the back end for that kind of system? Does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah. So Emblem's an infrastructure company, infrastructure tools and education. You can use a vault for uh, NFTs, for DeFi, for gaming, for metaverse, for storage. It's essentially like a crypto Swiss Army knife because all Emblem is at its core is a, a wallet address from a different blockchain inside of an NFT. And so with that, with the private keys that exist on uh, on Ethereum, although the, the native asset exists on its native chain. So for example, when you send an ordinal, if you're going to send a Bitcoin DGOD into an emblem vault, the DGOD exists still on Bitcoin because it's in a taproot wallet, but the private keys are locked up in the vault. And that's the NFT, the ERC721 is what trades. So some people, they'll take that D-God then, they'll go put it into their on-cyber gallery. Some people will take that D-God and go on to NFT Fi and borrow against it. Some people will take it and go sell it on OpenSea or go Blair Farm. It's, there's really lots of options that you can do. But when a Adam and I joined the team, we said we needed to really narrow down the focus and make it as simple as possible for the users to understand. There is a, there is a huge, huge market for Emblem Vault in DeFi. Uh, we're just not there yet because we're focused on uh, NFTs. But there are users who go in and they'll take their, they could take their D God and go put it inside fractional.art and then fractionalize ERC20 tokens against it and then go trade those 
as the way that they choose. It's uh, there's a lot of different use cases for it. Okay, but yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I guess my main question would be, so like, I guess you don't need an answer to this, but so next next stage would be basically duplicating the 721 bridge for like Solana, et cetera, et cetera. Would it not? Yeah. So we're not a bridge. Just want to make sure you emphasize that. There's three ways okay. to move assets across chain, at least that I'm aware of. There's bridges, right? And what a bridge is, is they basically print a synthetic token on the other side. There's wrapping, which is what you see WBTC. <clears throat> and then there's a vault. And if I had to, to make an analogy, this is the same one that I use. So don't uh, get mad if those have heard this already. If blockchains are countries, then there's three ways to move between these countries. You have a bridge, which would be the equivalent of like an actual bridge, driving across it maybe, or type of airplane. You have wrapping, which um, I don't actually have a good analogy for. <laughs> Still compare, working on the analogy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like teleport, I guess. I don't know. Uh, and and vaults would be comparative of like a shipping container. You're putting something in a shipping container and you're moving it across. And so the real asset is still inside of that container itself. It's not a synthetic that's on the other side. It's not put into another contract. It's just a wallet that exists inside of an ERC-721 or ERC-1155 token. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. Okay, yeah, I was just trying to see where the focus was. Like, from, from my perspective as like a collector and doing the ordinal focus and stuff right now, it seems like the initial goal for me would be like, bring as many people from Solana over to ordinals, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, the ultimate goal emblem right now is deployed on Ethereum, Polygon and BNB. We have goals to deploy on ordinals, to deploy on Solana, to deploy on BNB and or, uh, Cardano and all these other ones. We still have to actively explore, you know, what's possible or not, but let's, I'll use this example of rare Pepe's. Are you familiar with rare Pepe's by chance? I, I have some, yes. I do own some rare Pepe's. So imagine this rare Pepe curated collection we have on Ethereum is also deployed on Bitcoin, on Solana, on Polygon, on all these other chains. And then there's a button that says you can move this rare Pepe to any of the curated collections across any of the blockchains. And so you're basically meeting collectors where they are. And that's probably one of a handful of final products for curated collections. But that ability to, you know, have Rare Pepe in your ecosystem, because let's say you're, you're building a metaverse on Solana and you want to have that Nakamoto card in your gallery on Solana, I think anybody should have that ability to do so. And that's what Emblem Vault does, is we're a multi-chain tool that allows, right now, the focus is of facilitating NFTs across or from any blockchain on any blockchain. Based. I love it. Uh, I'll just go back to my initial suggestion and I can shut up and you can kick me off. But um, can you guys like give us, I don't know, I haven't played with it enough to know this, if this is possible yet, but it feels like I should basically have an upgraded version of my OpenSea profile on Emblem Vault with a multi-chain kind of focus, right? Yeah, so we don't have social profiles right now, um, right? That would be a component of an NFT, of an Emblem marketplace, which we've discussed and that was the initial conversation. So okay. uh if we do have a social profile of some sort, it, like as that said, first thought comes to as a marketplace, but we'd have to figure it out because right now Emblem just exists on marketplaces or whatever the protocols that want to integrate it. We don't own, outside of the Emblem Vault protocol, we don't own any other protocols, but could change in the future. All right. Um, so that was actually a really good question. So thank you uh, for asking that because I'm sure some people were confused. So what are the benefits then, uh, right? We went over some of the, the issues with the legacy contracts. So if you're a user, you're like, okay, what, is, what are the benefits? So what happened, and we, we observed this with the Rare Pepe collection of users uh, having to unvault their legacy vault to the curated, and uh, it just did not work well. We have a little over 200 assets in about three months. And we've just come to decide and we've just, you know, we've just come to understand that users, even if there is a little bit of friction, they just don't want to do it, especially if they have to pay to an unvault and vault, right? So if I want to take my Nakamoto card and move it to the Rare Pepe collection, right now I got to pay $10 to unvault and then $10 to vault. Now, if I have 300 Rare Pepe's in vaults, right, that's going to cost me, you know, four ETH to do so or three ETH to do so. On this side, it, the migration that we're doing for the users is free. There's no gas fee. So if you have 500 vaults, or even we'll use a smaller number. If you have 20 vaults, it would cost you the equivalent of, what is that, 400 bucks or something? 
four hundred, right? Four thousand. I don't know. I'm bad at math. Um, now you don't have to pay for anything because we're doing it for you. And I will explain the process uh, after this. So for a lot of users, doing nothing is the best option because you don't have to pay. You don't have to. You get to save your time. And uh, we've actually had a lot of requests of users actually asking to do it for them. And we watched and observed the Rare Pepe curated collection to kind of give us a case study on whether it's the right option or not. Yep. We went over, Adam went over, you know, increased project discoverability, protocol discoverability, gets its own OpenSea collection. So you can see a future, the OpenSea leaderboard, it says Doge Party, Counterparty, Rare Pepe, 12 full Bitcoin punks. Etc. as their own unique collections where you can go and bid on traits and etc. Uh, shared creator royalties, of course, this is a case by case basis, but having the ability, you know, to share some of those royalties with the project creator, with the, the protocol foundation, uh, with whoever it is after that discussion, it's something that we're very excited and open to just as we're sharing uh, royalties 33% with the BRC20 creators for a BRC20 curated collection just as we're sharing royalties with the Rare Pepe uh, creators, every time their card sells, they get a share of that royalty. You know, we can do that with, with all of these new upgraded ones. To an extent, of course, I have to say it depends on uh, the circumstances as all blockchain protocols and are different. So increased smart contract security, as we discussed, and functionality. These contracts are upgradable, so we can add uh, different types of features um, based off of who is the team behind that that individual collection or protocol based collection? So, uh, if you're right, if you're Yuga Labs and you, the twelve fold curated collection, you you could take your twelve folds now and then go put it into you know other side. But maybe they need some sort of other functionality on the contract. We could work with them to build that so that it is uh, so that it integrates well with with other side. That's just an example. This cool feature we have as well, which I think is good for creators, is uh, the ability to migrate from protocol-based curated collections to project-based curated collections. What, yeah, what's the big one? The, what does that even mean, right? Let, so, me, let me break it down for you simply. It. It's like yeah. a simple one that, that pretty much everybody in this room is going to understand. So we're going to have Namecoin, for example. Namecoin is going to be a protocol-level um, curated collection. So on that curated collection on OpenSea will be all the Namecoin assets. And if you want to mint more, nor, you know, if I make a brand new Namecoin asset today, I can put it in that collection, right? From that, we can then pull out puny codes, for example, most well-known, you know, Namecoin collection. They can have their own curated collection and we'll have their own when we do this. But say another Namecoin down the road in five years, a new Namecoin thing pops up, right? And it's, there's this great PFP collection. It's punks on Namecoin and everybody loves them and they want their own curated collection. We can pull them out uniquely and separately and create their own curated collection for OpenSea. And that is just, it's huge. It's huge, man. Um, so yeah, I'm super psyched about that functionality that's going to be possible going forward. Yeah, I've talked to Dogfather about this too, about the Doge Party uh, collection or protocol, right? You've had NFTs on Dogecoin since 2014. A lot of people don't know that. <clears throat> but there's really, right now, there's no emergent leader of Dogecoin NFTs. So they're all going to sit in this protocol of Dogecoin. And wh whenever that leader does pop up, then we have that ability to upgrade them to their own individual. So for example, there's one that's called Rare Doge, which is like Rare Pepe's. If now that increased, you know, exposure um, allow or shines the light, and people on ETH decide that's what they want, and to be the leader, then we can then move it to its own collection. So yeah. it's a it's a very very exciting time for that for for non EVM based projects. <clears throat> uh, increased decentralized product. I kind of explained that already. We've talked with a handful of protocols from DLCs, discrete discrete log functions to to key encryption protocols and storages to find out what's the best way to create a more decentralized emblem product. And as I said, that's something we want as well. So moving here will give us that additional functionality. API infrastructure, we've been slowly building out. Uh, as you, if, you could go, if you go to our documentation, you can see there's APIs for um, balance checkers and curse ordinals and, and all these other <coughs> things, inscriptions, right? Get inscribe and then get it on Ethereum. 
So we're going to keep adding that as Emblem moves to like, like this, this pivotal tool and infrastructure company. And then the Coval discount system and future integrations. Right? Coval has moved to, uh, to become a discount. So right now the vaulting fee is $20 in ETH. But if you own 50,000 Coval, which is about 500 bucks, that gets chopped down 50%. So the Coval is used for our power users. Currently, we do have some plans for future integrations, right? Maybe hint, we maybe want to like token gate some of the APIs, right? Or create something where you have to use Coval to, to purchase some of the future things that we want to build. Um, this all can happen now with kind of this upgraded infrastructure, which I know there's over 7,000 Coval holders. So I know you guys would be excited to hear that. And so here, even if you go in the medium, you can see some of this estimated supply post-migration. We're also going to be creating an Emblem Vault Open. The name is still to be determined, which is essentially just a new version of Emblem Vault Legacy for those you know, multi-blockchain uh, vaults. Let's say you want to take an Ethereum asset, a Bitcoin asset, and a Solana asset and put it all in a single vault because you're selling a package deal or whatever the case is. You'll be able to do that on our new contract and then the project based ones are super cool right Th this this is crazy because rare pepe post migration is going to have twenty two thousand rare pepes in it mm. that is insane to think sure. about right like what kind of uh price impact or i guess exposure uh will that have on rare pepe because there's twenty two thousand in here like that just because of the sheer sorry it's getting a phone call uh, just because of the the sheer amount of size of Rare Pepe, the math that I've done is you can have about 200,000 assets vaulted without... That's if you disclude any Rare Pepe that has 1,000 supply or over. You could easily see this being like a top 50 collection just because of how many NFTs can be in that collection, right? And what kind of impact does that have on Rare Pepe as uh, people become more familiar with it? So that's like my one of my favorite components. 22,000. We're going to be creating a fake rares collection as well, right? Puny Codes is getting its own collection. Some of these other ones that um, maybe aren't lesser known, which we could, I, I, I'm almost confident one of these collections will uh, catch more traction now that it's easier. Something like Bitcoin Crops or Memory Chain, Oasis Mining, some of these um, very early ones, right? Puny Codes um, finally getting their own. Uh, there will be some, uh, some of those emergence. So we're getting about 30 to 35 curated collections post-migration. And that is going to be happening on July 12th. And yeah, I mean, just to jump in and and you know speak to the historical NFT collector again, real quick. I mean, how great would it have been if? I mean, I did specifically. I recall Bull Run 2021 not pushing people to OpenSea to buy rare Pepe's because it was too confusing, and I thought people were going to lose money. Right, specifically not tweeting about it because I was concerned people were going to lose money. You know, next bull run, knock on wood, hope it happens uh, for people to be able to communities to be able to point people directly to curated collections where they can go look at puny codes or blockheads or whatever it is, um, you know, spells of Genesis, whatever, and feel 100 percent comfortable that nobody's going to get, um, you know, hit a, a scammer or run into something, uh, you know, a bad actor. It's just, it's going to be huge for the next bull run. This is like the infrastructure we need as a community. And yeah, so I'm, I'm pumped for it, man. All right. MTNS, I'm giving you another chance this time. Please do not recall me or I'm going to have to remove you again. Go ahead. <laughs> keep hoping for the best, Jake. You keep hoping for the uh, best. Bro. Yeah, I use, I, I try, I try to give them some hearts, but, uh, you, you know, know, it's a red flag if they're not following you, bro. If they're not following you, you don't even bring them up, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, decentralized, go ahead. So uh, what I'm hearing here is that uh, I need to load up on rare Pepe's, right? Mm, it, should always, <laughs> it should always be loading up on rare Pepe's, my friend. This is true. This is true. Okay. Always, always. Rare yeah. Pepe's and Spaz of Genesis. Always be buying. Yes, always be buying. I think fake rares will actually have like a good amount too because you do have a lot of uh, ETH NFT artists who have rare, who have created fake rares from, you know, Coldy to Mike 3 to, you know, Art Gnome to literally almost everyone has a fake rare, which is kind of the successor to Rare Pepe's. At least that was on Counterparty. Uh, so I think it'll it'll help kind of jumpstart that 
that as well and create it's just really good for the pepe community uh, memes were born on counterparty or tokenized memes were born on counterparty and uh that's that's what makes us really really excited totally so here now is kind of the big thing right what are what are my options i have five rare pepe cards what do i do there's two options you do nothing and if you do nothing, we will automatically migrate your legacy vault to a specific curated collection that best matches its asset. There's no cost to the users, uh, no time commitment, or anything of that nature. What, let's say you're you're not confident in the process, or you just prefer um, you get your stuff off Ethereum and you want to bring it back to, to Namecoin or Doge Party or whatever it is. It's the same process. You just go unlock your emblem legacy vault, and you import the seed phrase or the private keys to the wallet of your choice. And if you have no idea how to do this, go to our YouTube channel because we've created a video for literally every single blockchain that exists, or at least 90% of them. It's a very, very simple process. Um, watch the videos, read the blogs. They're all there for you guys for this specific reason for this day. And now the big question that everyone's watched, right? How is this technically possible? I want to trust Emblem Vault, but I'm unsure what to do. So first, you got to understand what migration even means. So migrating is not new in any sense to uh, to Ethereum, to NFTs. It's It's been something that's been happening for probably almost a decade now at this point. But we'll keep it to just the NFTs itself. I think from my understanding, the first migration of NFTs was actually EtherID, moving their 2015 contract to the 2016 contract. And they did that with um, an airdrop. One of the most famous migrations, right? Larva Labs with the V2 CryptoPunks. They found a bug in the V1 contract. They airdropped the V2s. Same thing with ENS. ENS uh, moved to a 2019 contract for, with, from their 2017 contract um, to migrate those assets. And then more recently, we've seen two kind of move. D-Gods moved, right? They moved Utes to Polygon. And then they moved D-Gods, uh, Solana D-Gods to Ethereum D-Gods. They didn't use an airdrop with this method. They used a one-way bridge, which I believe was it was very unique. I don't think I've seen a one-way bridge for migration before. No, you, you know, you've seen it now again. Ordinals, baby. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, Televerse. Uh, yeah. that's, what, that's what I call a one-way bridge. You literally just burn the asset and then get it on the other side. Mint a new one on the other side. That's, that's a one-way bridge, man. <laughs> one-way bridge. And the most recent one, which caused a lot of... Uh, uh, conversation was Truth Labs uh, and Nifty Labs. They migrated Goblin Town, Illuminati, and the 187, uh, and they did an airdrop. We actually got on a call this week with Truth Labs and with uh, Nifty Lab or was it Nifty Labs to discuss their experience with the migration. Um, and they they gave us a, lo a lot a lot of information. Uh, Adam was on that call. What what was your takeaway from from that conversation? Really helpful as far as coordinating with marketplaces uh, to pause trading around the, the contracts. Um, they gave us some good uh, advice there. Um, they gave us advice as far as community goes. It was interesting. Uh, their their main takeaway from the community is their community was fine with it. But the FUD around it from crypto Twitter was not fine with it and um, was interesting. They, they really their main thing was they wanted people to know about it. And boy, did people know about it. Right. So they they actually, you know, they, they actually were successful in, you know, what they did, which if you guys tracked it, the, the, the art they did with the guy giving the middle finger and stuff, um, you know, those guys are quite brilliant and it, it actually worked and played right into what they were trying to do, which was a raise awareness around the, their migration. Um, ours is, you know, different technically than what they're doing, but they had some really nice advice for us. Yeah, they, they were really good. Shout out to AJT and the Nifty Labs team. So, okay. So now to the migration, what is happening and think of it, I'll let Adam do this exp explanation because sure. my, my, uh, my exotic one with, with our phone <laughs> was, not received, was not received very well. <laughs> I think, look, most people like myself, you know, we're not big brains. We're not really interested too much in the hyper-technical details, right? That's for the devs to kind of work on. But basically the way I, I look at it is this, right? Your NFT, let's take, um, Let's take your rare Pepe because that's the, the simple one which everybody understands. Your, your rare Pepe is held in a wallet that's inside of an emblem vault right now. Think of that emblem vault as a box, right? 
and that wallet's inside that box. So your counterparty asset, your, your rare Pepe is sitting in that wallet that's sitting inside of a box. All we're doing is basically pointing to a brand new box. So your wallet doesn't change. Uh, your rare Pepe doesn't move outside of that wallet, doesn't move at all. We're simply swapping the old legacy box for a brand new box. That's it. Um, so the asset itself doesn't move. The wallet that holds that asset never moves. It never moves from uh, your ownership as far as like your wallet address. Never moves. We're simply giving you a new box that holds that, that wallet. And that new box will show up right in your wallet, show right up on OpenSea and everything. You literally don't have to do anything. Uh, the old box will still be there. This is important to know. That old box is still going to be there. It's going to be labeled as empty. And basically, it's an empty vault now. So that's an empty box, an empty shell. That'll still be in your wallet as well. And you can do whatever you want. You can hide it. Do nothing with it. It doesn't matter. That'll still be there. It'll basically be untradeable. Um, but just so you know, those boxes, that box isn't going to get burned, the old box. That, that box is still going to be in your wallet. But the new box is going to be there as well. And that new box uh, is going to have that same wallet, your same rare Pepe, same everything. It's just a brand new box. Yeah. So that's, this is where it comes into the kind of, or the, the discussion with uh, coordinating with the NFT marketplaces to freeze trading. And so on July 11th, OpenSea, along with all of the other marketplaces that we've talked with, is going to freeze trading indefinitely. Um, and it's up to those marketplaces whether they want to delist the legacy collection or if they just want to pause it and allow it um, to trade afterwards because there's going to be mostly empty boxes on there as well. But there are some vaults that will not be migrated, the ones that are locked up in contracts. So if your legacy vault is inside fractional.art, if it's inside Uniquely, if it's, in, if it's inside of a pseudo swap pool, if it's in a, a loan on one of the NFT loan platforms, that will not be migrated. But lucky for you, whenever it is pulled out of that contract, you could go to emblem.finance and you can unvault it and move it into any of the 30 new curated collections that uh, is pertinent to that. Uh, it's taken a lot of coordination. We've gotten in contact with, with most of the NFT marketplaces. The NFT protocols that we uh, have talked with have already begun to delist uh Emblem Vault, so on Arcade and NFT5, the two loan platforms, they have delisted the legacy collection. There are some loans that still are outstanding. Uh, Ordinal's Market has, mo has moved on from the, the vaulting. They have removed that. Uh, OpenSea will freeze. We've already, already we have a, an open channel with them. We're working with them uh, very actively to ensure that not only the Emblem Legacy contract is frozen during this time, but all of the new collections will be verified uh, upon deployment. So that is uh, really big. It took us a long time to build this relationship with OpenSea, but we have a very good relationship now, direct line of communication. So um, it's very well. We've talked with X2Y2, talked with Magic Eden. There's a few, there's like two or three that we haven't discussed with uh, yet. So we're still actively working on that and we'll, I'll continue to update this uh, as we kind of move forward. But it is important to know this, and I, would, I do really kind of want to emphasize this. Do not trade on the legacy contract after migration. I would encourage not to. Of course, there's going to be some DGENs who just don't listen. But again, right, 99% of them are going to be empty boxes. So if you want to go throw up bids and yeah. potentially... 90, well, 99.999. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. going to be they're going to be empty, so please do not um, engage in that. If we're working with OpenSea, right? Well, for from my understanding, and we're still waiting for a little bit of clarification with OpenSea, when they pause the collection, it removes all the bids, it removes all the listings, it it removes all of the auctions. Um, we're waiting to see if the the one point of clarification we're waiting to see is that if they can remove it off of Seaport, which is basically what Reservoir and all these other uh, marketplaces use if that's the case right that solves 99 percent of the issues but uh also encouragement to stay away from any aggregators afterwards that are using the legacy collection 
because right, we're going individually to every NFT marketplace. They have to actively freeze it. And if they decide not to, then it's going to get very, very bad on their platform. And like I said, we have reached out to all of them and sent a message at least. There's about two that haven't responded yet. And there's one who's kind of giving us a little bit of trouble. But um, you know, we're giving users over two weeks from today until the 12th, about two weeks, to go unvault your assets if that's what you want to do. We have no issue if you want to. Again, there is no problem if you want to go and vault it and go watch from the sidelines. If 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 you if there's any ounce of uncertainty with this, if you feel, I would encourage you to unvault them and hold them throughout the process. Sure. Uh, I, also, I also want to clarify that in Emblem's three years that has been deployed on Ethereum, we've never lost one asset ever um, to some sort of like troubleshooting on the back end, every trouble, every complication with the vault um, has been solved to this day. Yep. Look, man, holding stuff on its native chain is like, you know, we're self-sovereign individuals and believe in it, right? There's no issue. You will get zero pushback from us for keeping stuff on its native chain on vault. Hold your rare Pepe's on counterparty. You know, you do you. That's good for you. I have no... Zero, zero, less than zero issue. I encourage you to do it. So, um, but we do want to make this as painless as possible. And certainly a zero migration fee, uh, zero gas fees altogether. I mean, look, this is going to cost us, I don't even know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 to do this, uh, which would have been paid for by the users previously. Um, you know, I think it's, we're doing a solid, I think. Uh, for the community as a whole and because we believe in this like we believe that these these collections should have their own pages we believe from a collectability standpoint a future you know when i'm looking at stuff in the future and i'm looking into historical nfts or you know just other chains ordinals whatever i want to be able to buy with confidence everybody wants to be able to buy with confidence so i'm yeah it's just it's it's the obvious way forward it took a while to get here obviously it's a massive build um props to shannon and the devs for you know working on this um but th this is the way forward i'm 100 convinced on that there's a lot to look forward to on the other side i pulled up here on youtube we added it this to the bottom of the uh the press release uh, a preview of the new ui um that's coming to emblem vault we're also going to um shorten or at least the goal is to uh change first the vaulting experience, but also reduce the amount of clicks required to create a vault. We know it's taken a few steps and also Emblem is uh, highly inefficient on mobile. So this new UI upgrade, uh, Emblem worked frictionlessly and efficient on mobile. This UI or this UX that you could see here, very similar to what you see on OpenSea, what you see on Blur. We're trying to make it as familiar as possible, adding a leaderboard, adding some other gadgets and hoo -hahs. And uh, the, the vaulting experience, again, it should just be a few clicks. And that's kind of the goal.